All right, thank you, April, for that generous introduction. All right, again, welcome to AWE 2021. It is amazing to see everybody here in person. This is my first time in front of this many people in a while, so it feels a little bit weird, but also good. Uh, if you're joining remotely, welcome you as well. I commend all of you. I was listening to Ori's talk this morning about how long he's been promoting this and involved, and I know many of you have been building AR and XR and advocating for it and starting companies around it for a long time, for many years. And I really think we're, we're having a moment. I think AR, XR generally is at the center of the stage right now, and you guys are at the center of that universe, so I think you're at the right place at the right time. Um, applause to you. So as April mentioned, at Niantic we have this particular mission. We're trying to inspire people to explore the world together. That's what we're about, trying to get people off the couch, walking, exercising, spending time with family and friends. And I have to say, over the last 18 months, that mission has taken on a new significance for us. It's been tough. A lot of these things have been denied to us. Looking back, tech has helped to try to sort of bridge that gap. I mean, it's helped me stay in touch with my family. It's helped many of us continue to operate our companies, you know, despite everything that's been going on. But I think we'd have to admit that as much as it's done for us, you know, there's also a gap that it hasn't been able to fill. You know, those days of just sort of Exhaustion, you know, from too many hours in front of Zoom, then delivery food, then too many hours of Netflix, in my case. It leaves a void. And I think that's why so many of us are happy to be here today and happy and eager to get back out and rediscover our favorite local neighborhood restaurant, our favorite parks, go see family, go on trips to go see our favorite places. And I think augmented reality can play an important role in supporting that kind of behavior, the stuff that we are basically evolved to do as human beings. And it's that lens that I want to use to talk about what's going on in XR and spatial computing. So I do want to touch on three themes. And the first of those, yes, Ori nailed it. We are going to use the M word here, so don't, don't get alarmed. But we're going to talk about the real world metaverse. Talking about using tech to build a better world. Using everything that we've been working on to help people lead richer and more fulfilling lives. I think we can do that. Second, I want to talk about Lightship launched yesterday and how we all can work together to build this better reality. And finally, I want to tackle something that I think is important, and it's building this in an equitable, open, accessible way. Building this thing responsibly. Not being blind to what's been going on in the tech industry for the last 10 to 15 years, but learning from that. Being mindful of the choices we make so that the next version can be a better version. So let's start with this idea of building something for the real world. The metaverse, yeah, everybody's talking about the metaverse. Some of the biggest names in tech are out staking their claim to the metaverse. Staking their claim to what I consider our collective future. Some of those companies have gone so far as to change their name to show how focused they are on it on the opportunity. So this morning, I want to announce the new name for Niantic. Here to all of you. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Joking aside, like, let's not mistake the importance of this moment, though. We are at the precipice at one of those big platform changes that happen every once in a long while in tech. It's an important moment. And the decisions that we make now about what we build and how we build it are going to affect this industry for decades to come. 
people have been skeptical about AR. People have talked about, are we really going to have glasses that people can wear around and you know, not be sort of socially exiled for doing it? Um, we've been working at this frontier, and we're not quite there. But I'm a believer. I absolutely think this is a trajectory that we're on with technology, where it becomes smaller, becomes, gets out of our way, moves to a wearable form factor. This big transition to AR is going to happen. And yes, there are going to be failures. We, we've seen some already. We can joke about them. <clears throat> That's the way it's always been with these platform transitions. And we probably will see more failures before we see the big successes. It's going to come in fits and starts. I was around, I'm old enough to have been around, I'll admit that, for several of these platform transitions. I think all the way back to the advent of the personal computer, coming from mainframe and mini computers. And you know, back then, big predictions were made, but these things were really, they were toys. You know, we played games on them, maybe we programmed games on them. And yet, they ultimately became indispensable. And we do have a computer in every home. And we rely on them for almost everything that we do. Same thing for the internet. Coming out of government research, you know, early online access was a hobbyist plaything. Bad modem connections, bulletin board services, maybe some online games, a little bit of AOL and CompuServe, grand visions for what impact that tech would have, but it took a while. Ultimately, though, we all did get connected. We're all wired for broadband. Probably all of you, as you sit here now, are wired for broadband. Big companies have been built around the internet and cloud computing. Billion dollar companies, now trillion dollar companies. So we've seen these happen before. The next one's going to happen. I think it could be the most important one of all of these. Because all the stuff that we've been working on for the last 50 years, all the tech, the services, the data, the connectivity, it meets the real world. These things are finally fully coming together. There are huge implications for that. It's going to change how we exist in the world, how we move, how we interact, and how we communicate within it. So when we talk about building a real world metaverse, that's, that's what we're talking about. Now, you've heard the term metaverse. We've referenced Neil Stevenson already this morning. That's the first thing I think of when someone brings up that term. Loved, the, loved his work. Read Snow Crash 15 years ago. Love William Gibson. Love The Matrix. Can't wait to see the next one. But we all know how those stories work. You know, in those fictional versions of the future, the world has become such a mess. Things have gone so horribly wrong that people have to escape it into some kind of virtual reality where people live and work and play. So I would ask all of you, is that the future that you imagine? Is that the future you want for yourselves, for your children? It's not what I want. It's not the future we believe will happen at Niantic. We think we can use this tech not to escape from the world into a virtual reality, but to build a better reality, to build a better world, one that we really want to exist in, that supports the stuff we do as humans, moving, exploring, and being with other people, and preserves that special place of the real world, all those atoms, this giant, awesome, interesting planet as a place of purpose and novelty and community. So that's what we want to build. We try to do that at Niantic. We ask ourselves constantly how this tech can create little nudges you know, in the design of the platform and the products. Just little nudges times billions of interactions makes a big difference. A nudge to get off the couch, get some exercise, spend time with friends and family. We ask, could we create a service, a game, an application that helps somebody discover a public space that's right in their neighborhood they've never really noticed before? Could it help us see that the magic, history, the beauty, it's hiding in plain sight. It's right in front of us in places we know but don't really know, 
and places we've yet to discover. When we think about what kind of tech do we need to realize this sort of big, grand vision. We know that we need tech that can build services that really fuse these things together, that add information, interaction, and yes, interactive creatures. Got to be part of it, like Pikmin. I've seen some flowers around the hotel this morning, so hopefully some of you have discovered Pikmin Bloom. Hopefully some of you are planting flowers, make the world a little more beautiful. We know that we're going to need tech like hyper-accurate maps to really align things in a realistic way. I'm going to talk more about that today. We know that we need tech to share state and to share interactions between people in real time, at scale. We're going to talk more about that today. We think we're going to get there. And we imagine a future where someday billions of people are going to exist in the real world, but with these digital layers. They'll be able to customize them, even make their own. And yes, it's going to make the world more magical and fun, but it's also going to make it more informative and more accessible for all of us. When we think about building for this, we are calling these creations reality channels. So what do we mean by a reality channel, a channel on top of reality? We're thinking about, this is one example, we're thinking about a future version of Pokemon Go for smart glasses. This is a real working code, by the way, on a phone today. We don't have our glasses yet. But a version where your virtual creations really feel like they exist in the world, like the Pokemon are living at the neighborhood park. They're just waiting for you to go and discover them and interact with them. And with services like this, we can educate, entertain, guide, and assist people, and really transform everyone's daily life into something that's just a little bit more magical. So we think this shift, this next computing platform that you all have been working so hard on for the last many years, the creation of these kinds of services and applications like reality channels, huge opportunity, I think. Huge opportunity for Niantic, certainly, but for everybody who is building this together. It's an opportunity to, number one, build some important and valuable companies, many of them. We've seen that happen before. But maybe even more important than that, it's the opportunity for us to shape this technology, decide how much humanity, how much human values get incorporated into this next version of tech that we use every day, all the time. All that collectively is going to determine our impact on the world and what we leave behind for future generations. OK, big vision. Let's get down to brass tacks. How are we going to do this together? We took a big step yesterday for Niantic. We're opening the vaults of tech and data, and we launched the first part of the Lightship platform. It's available now worldwide to all developers, available for download. It's the same tech that we use to build all of our products, Ingress and Pokemon Go and Harry Potter and Pikmin Bloom. It's now available here to you. So the part that we launched yesterday is specifically the Lightship AR development kit. The Lightship ARDK. It's our first drop, our first installment of Lightship. Very excited about it, and I hope it's the first chapter in a long story of us together building this better future. Got lots of devs already signed up, lots of cool demos starting to stream in. Some of them you've seen, I'll show you some more this morning. So looking at it in more detail, there are three components that are part of Lightship, three key pillars, real-time mapping, understanding, semantics, and sharing, multiplayer. And they're all designed to work very closely with one another and to be super easy to use, to program to. Taken together, these foundational pillars, we think, unlock a huge possibility to make AR finally feel like it's alive in the world, present in the world, aware of it, interacting with it, 
and most importantly, able to be shared with other people. So let's look at each of these in a little more detail. Real-time mapping. So with Lightship, any public space can, be, can become a place where people gather and interact and play. But before that can happen, you all know, you've got to map it first. You have to understand it first. And mapping is deep in our DNA, our history at Niantic. We know that it has to be fast, lightweight, seamless. And that's exactly what the Lightship ARDK delivers. So you're seeing here a map being created. Pretty simple process. This is showing kind of a fancy version of it. There's a less visually fancy version of it in Ingress and Pokemon Go today. Importantly, this tech works on many kinds of devices. It works on devices that have LiDAR, devices that don't have LiDAR, works across platforms, Android, iOS, and in the future, on HMDs. Really excited about the work that Qualcomm's been doing in that area. So what it does is it creates a real-time mesh of the environment from this visual input with the help of other sensors if they're available. And then we offer that to you as a really easy surface to access and program against. Not only do we give you this mesh that's dynamically created and extended as the session is going on, we also create what we call a virtual game board. So we give you a logical representation of all the surfaces in that view in real time that makes sense for you to place virtual creations in. So they can navigate through that world, so you can place them where they kind of should be, down on top of the bench or the tree or the desk. In addition to that, we also provide another layer of realism through CV-based, computer vision-based occlusion. So of course, you can do occlusion with geometry for those static objects, but you know, when a person or a dog or a car sort of passes through the scene, we also give you a CV-based real-time occlusion there. So you can create really realistic, uh, real, really realistic scenes. Here, you're seeing the game board. You're seeing a very simple object. You know, it could be a cute animated character. But it's quite easy to write pathing algorithms and to have those objects traverse that world in a way that makes sense. Of course, once that geometry exists, then it's part of your digital world that you can build to. So physics work, you can throw things around. It's all there as raw material for you to work with. This is another example. I included this one just because I like it. It's pretty. Uh, we're mapping an area around this tree, this grassy surface, and we've planted some AR flowers. We're going to see them nicely bloom. I just thought they were beautiful. That's what we mean when we talk about adding a little bit of magic to the world, stuff like this. OK, the second pillar, understanding. So concurrently with mapping, while all this mapping stuff is going on, the real-time mapping, the virtual game board, the CV-based occlusion, at the same time, in real time, we're also giving you a semantic understanding of everything that's in the scene. So every pixel is classified. As you see in this example, sky, trees, ground, water, number of different classes. So you get to know about the content of the world at the same time you know about the structure of the world. Really incredibly powerful to be able to use those things together. Again, making your virtual creations really grounded in the world. They can react to it now. They can do sensible things. Your favorite cute animated character can ask to be taken for a walk to the park, wants to see a flower. And you can know when that happens very easily. We've been promised monsters on buildings since the beginning of AR. I'm happy to say that we can finally deliver monsters on buildings. In this case, it's a beautiful butterfly. It's a virtual sky. Importantly, this didn't require any complicated pre-mapping of the area, any complicated pre-construction of the geometry. This is all just happening in real time. So really a, a nice step forward for doing large-scale AR. The last part, sharing. So it's been said that if only one person's seeing a vision, it's a hallucination. <laughs> but if we all see something together, it can be magic. That's what sharing enables. Sharing's actually really important for how we as human beings process reality. We see stuff. Hopefully other people see the same stuff. 
If they don't, we know we've got a problem. <laughs> we talk about it, and we process it, and we understand it. It's really, really important for building AR that feels like it belongs in the world. So the sharing tech lets, again, people on different kinds of devices, different operating systems, synchronously interact with AR creations in real time. Even in this like, basic form that we have it today, adding this to an AR creation out in the world, it's a huge step forward. I think it's transformative. So let's think about when we bring all three of these things together into a single experience. I'm going to show you one more demo here. It's from our friends at Shueisha. Shueisha is a, Shueisha is a Japanese manga company. They've been making manga for about 100 years. Lots of TV shows and movies have been built on their work. Extremely creative company. And finally, all this creative output can now live in the world thanks to Lightship and Lightship ARDK. So what you're seeing here is some of the characters from One Piece. This is one of their breakout IPs. And we're seeing multiple people here in the scene. So this is the multiplayer tech at work. Interacting with the characters. This is shared state. Everybody's seeing the same thing. Characters in the same place, same animations. We're seeing them path through the environment, so knowing what's where from our, from our mapping. We're seeing occlusion at work here, so they feel natural and really in the world. It's really great. Really feels like AR finally is part, part of the world. It works on a small scale, but also works on a big scale. So here we see the airship coming in just over the roof of the nearby building. Really, really excited about what we've done with Lightship and thrilled that we've got it out there and in the hands of developers around the world. It's pretty nice. There's one more piece I want to talk about, though. People have called it the grand challenge of AR, the map, mapping the world, a persistent shared representation of reality that we can address and anchor things to and bring all this multiplayer content and real-time mapping and understanding and really fuse it with the world so that we can tailor experiences that are specific to very, very particular parts of the world. So we have a version of that. We've got it working now. I'm going to show it to you. This is an example of the map being created. It, this is kind of a fancy version of it. So you're seeing the mesh as well as sort of a visual demonstration of what's being collected as somebody maps. Players have been creating these maps with us for over a year first in Ingress and then in Pokemon Go. So now we have thousands of places that have been mapped. We have data for millions of places. And we're scaling up the processing pipeline to bring that to you. Once an area has been mapped, then it's there and we can localize against it. Again, on phones, different operating systems, different capabilities on those devices, one API that you write to. And here, you can see we've localized. That sort of aqua marine goop isn't, it wouldn't really be there in your app. That's just showing how the computer understands the map and demonstrating that reality is very closely aligned to where your digital brains think it is located. We're already building some Niantic applications that leverage this. This is one example. It's an app that we're getting ready to launch next year. I can't tell you any more details about it. But it's showing this process at work. So here we have a player who's, it's something like a, kind of a virtual geocaching mechanic that he's doing here. So he's localized into the space, and now he's going to hide something for other people to find. But hide it in a very specific spot. This isn't you know five meters in GPS. It's something that could be hidden in a nook of a statue, for example. And he's left some, he, he left some clues. So now we see another user who's localized. She's in the environment. She's following the clues. And now she's found the object. I think you can see from the expression on her face that it really is magic when it works. So the Niantic map is what we're calling it. Some people call this stuff visual positioning systems, virtual positioning systems. I just call it the map will be available as part of Lightship next year. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's a really important part of building this thing that we've been talking about as the real world metaverse. I want to pause and take a sip of water before we launch into this next part of the prezo. This is about us working together to learn from the past and build this thing in a responsible way. As excited as we are about the tech and what we can do with it, and we are very excited at Niantic, and as excited as we are about what developers around the world, like you, can build in AR, we recognize that this next phase of computing, this platform transition, it carries with it some big time responsibility. Something that we're cognizant of, and I think all of us, including everybody here at AWE, like we're gonna have to come to terms with this because we're gonna be making decisions about what this looks like in terms of platform and product and how much humanity, how human values come into play as we define this future together. I'm not here to tell you how to run your companies or what kind of products that you should build. I can just share my personal experience and our experience at Niantic. But I can challenge you to see this for what it is, to stop and think, because we're at this precipice. And the decisions we make now are going to shape that world that we pass on to future generations. I think it's, it's, it's an important moment. These things come, on, come along once every decade or two. I think it's an important moment in history. It's one of the most, most important moments in tech in the last 10, 20 years. Why? Well, we all know what's going on, OK? All of us, we've seen what happens. We put a small, connected computer in the hands of a few billion people around the world. We allow all those people to communicate, to share information in real time with one another. It's changed the way all of us lead our lives, certainly. It's been nothing short of transformative for humanity. But I think we've all begun to see that there's some downside here in terms of tracking, in terms of privacy, and in terms of the behaviors that the platforms and applications can be engineered to encourage in us. And as this tech breaks out of a four inch screen in your pocket and is superimposed into the world, that impact on all of us is gonna be magnified. And that means our responsibility is equally magnified. The metaverse, like the internet, <clears throat> it's gonna connect billions of people. It will have standards, just like the internet does, for how we treat one another. Civil, we not. What and how we communicate, is it truthful, is it not truthful? How do we treat people we disagree with? It's, got, it's gonna have all those problems that we've got right now. But think about it, when we combine that with the real world, it becomes an even bigger responsibility. Right now, we're building AR glasses that show us what this future is going to look like. We're building a reference design with Qualcomm, really excited about that partnership. Others are building glasses as well. We've got a pretty good idea of what immersive AR is going to feel like. It is coming. But when you think about the implications for something like tracking, I mean, tracking clicks, that's, that's one thing, OK? And we're wrestling with that. The industry's wrestling with that. Big companies are clashing over that right now. But think about a wearable device that's with you all day long. Maybe it's on your head. Probably knows where you're looking most of the time, where you're focused. Maybe it knows about other things, too, like your heart rate. My smartwatch right now knows my heart rate. Notice where you're looking. You see a product, an advertisement. What happened to you physiologically? Did your heart rate go up? What about if you see a person? Maybe your glasses recognize that specific person. What did your heart rate do? Think about your eyes and vision. What specifically are you looking at in a scene at any moment in time when you're out there in the world? Did your pupils dilate? When you see another person, what about your emotions? 
getting pretty good at predicting that too. Were you happy, sad, anxious? The thing is, this is not science fiction. We talked about Neil Stephenson. This is all real. Tech can do what I just described right now. And whether we allow that to evolve into this dystopia that we all know it could be, or whether we proactively take steps to turn it into something else, that's a collective job for all of us. The decisions that we make about what platforms we support, where are you going to put your talents and abilities, all that blood, sweat, and tears that you're pouring into your company and your product and your tech? What kinds of products, what kinds of services, what kinds of apps are we going to build? Are we going to think about the human impact and the human values? Or are we just going to stay on the path that we're on right now? That's the decision that's before all of us. OK. I know that's a heavy message to lay on all of you as we're starting this exciting conference. <laughs> And to be clear, I don't think it has to turn out that way. It's up to us, but it doesn't have to go in that direction. And Niantic, we definitely see a future where we collectively can make the kinds of choices that use this tech in incredibly positive ways, that reinforce the best of what the world has to offer, that draw people together, enable them to have fun and share experience together, and ultimately unite us, unite people, unite human beings, rather than divide us. With that, I want to close with two invitations. One is, if you found this at all interesting in terms of thinking about the future of the metaverse, the future of this technology, Lightship, come and see us starting tomorrow. Our booth is open. We've got people that would be very happy to talk to you. Also, if this whole like in-person thing is stressing you out, we have a quiet space that we set up. It's a meditation space. I meditate from time to time, so if you just want to go chill out, we also have a nice space for you to go and do that. The second thing is I want to talk about Niantic Ventures. So to demonstrate how serious we are about doing this together with you all, we just set up Niantic Ventures to help support people who share this vision of using tech to build a positive world. So if that's you, come and talk to us. If you're excited about being, building an inclusive future that makes people better people, so much the better. If you're building stuff that gets people outside and moving and exercising and socializing with other human beings in real life, then we're much more inclined to support your work. So if that's interesting, please reach out. There are online ways to get in touch with the fund, and there will be people tomorrow at the booth that can connect you. So I'm excited about the moment we're in. As a company, we're trying to approach this big tech transition mindfully, intentionally, to build that kind of inclusive, real-world metaverse that improves our world as a place that people want to live in, not escape from. And we hope all of you will join us on that journey. Thank you.